every breath I breathe, author of all eternity, giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory, maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your word.
right. Good morning. Amen. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Really? Dennis is here. How's everybody doing this morning? Dennis, it's great to see you, brother. No, we've been praying for you. We love you. It's, it's great to see you. Amen, brother. I'd like to, we have a special way of, of greeting our, our new people. So we, first of all, for our new guests, we, we're so glad that you came today. Know that we've been praying for you. Uh, it's not by happenstance that you're here today. It is truly God-ordained. Uh, we have been praying for you. And we, again, we have a special way of greeting you. We ask you to stay seated where you are. Members of regular tenders, get from where you are and, pray, and meet the people we've been praying for. if we can return back to our seats let us pray Father God we just Father we just come to you right now Father Father we just we thank you for just your grace and your mercy Father Father we just we give you this message Father we lift up our pastor to you Father I pray for everybody that's here today Father I pray for everybody that's in attendance I pray for those that aren't Father Father I ask that you keep them safe Father Again, just open our ears and eyes to hear and see the message that you have ready for us, Father. Prepare us for today, Father. Prepare us for this week, Father. We ask all this in your precious and holy name. Amen.
Everybody praise the Lord. God is good. God walked into the church this week and asked Miss Stacy at the receptionist desk up there. He said, where's the head hog of the trough? <laughs> he said, sir, we speak about our pastor, if that's who you mean, with a little more respect than that. He said, I have $100,000 I'd like to write to church this week. He said, well, let me get the big pig right now. <laughs> no, that was a joke, but you can write the check today if you'd like. Hey. <laughs> Good to see you this morning. Turn, turn the person beside you and tell them it's good to see them too. Hopefully you already gave them a welcome. Some of you sitting by your spouse. Hopefully it's good to see them. <laughs> uh, Karen, pull up that Israel slide for me. You got it right there? Let me make this, an, this announcement real quick uh, before I get myself in trouble. I did something really bad. I announced the Israel trip at another church before I announced it here. And we have about 28 spots already filled up on it. We take 50, so there are spots available, so don't freak out, but you just need to get a deposit in quickly if you're seriously thinking about going. In just a couple of weeks, on August the 27th, we'll have a meeting for those who are thinking about going and those who are going. It'll be a question and answer time and uh, share some things about the trip and what's involved. But if you've ever thought about going, uh, this is a great time. It's the best time of the year to go. That, it's just, that time of year is just an incredible time in, in, in March and April. So uh, get a brochure, get signed up. You can go online, put a deposit down, just leave it in the offering day, write down it's a deposit for the Israel trip. Deposit is $300 a person, but it is a phenomenal time in the Lord. We came back in September, or November of last year from a great, great trip. It was just life transforming. It's always a, it's always a time of revival. And I tell you, you'll never be the same once you go and experience the land of Israel and, and the Middle East and just see all that. What you've been reading about all these years just come alive right in front of you. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an awesome, incredible adventure really a pilgrimage, and I encourage you to take it with us. It's going to be fun. But get signed up, and uh, forgive me for telling somebody else about it first. But I think there's enough spots to fill our remaining spots with you guys, those who are interested in going. Amen? Now let's talk about this word on the screen today, healing, and the Word of God. All those words, by the way. Um, how many of you are just praying for healing in your life on some issue in your life? I think probably half people in this room are, uh, especially the older we get. Amen? You know, you've heard it said, getting old's not for wimps. I guarantee that's true. I don't think I was tough enough as a young man to handle what you'd go through when you get older. So, uh, but it, it's never fun. I think it just makes you get ready for heaven a little faster. And you say, I'm ready to go today. But uh, I do think this is an important topic and something I believe that uh, in churches hasn't been discussed enough, at least in uh, more what you call evangelical churches that are leaning on the conservative side like Baptist and some of the other Methodists and things like that. You don't hear healing mentioned a lot in those churches. In fact, it's interesting, this passage of Scripture that I will speak about today in this regard has been taken to mean a lot of different things, interpreted a lot of different ways by a lot of different theologians. But let me say, first and foremost, this, is a, this isn't a, a, an Assembly of God issue. It's a, not a Pentecostal issue. It's a Word of God issue. It's a Christian issue. And I would also add to that, healing can come in all different kinds of ways. Sometimes there's an emotional need that needs to be healed. Sometimes there's a, a physical need. Sometimes it manifests itself in a spiritual way. Obviously, the greatest healing you will ever have in all your life is when you get right with Jesus. And give your heart to Christ and finally come home to your heavenly Father who loves you and has been seeking you and ready for you to come home. That is the greatest of all healings. But I do believe that God does heal. God can heal. God will heal. But not always in every situation. And so I want to deal with that as too because that aspect of it, because there's a lot of people who just kind of put this in a, in a can and say, it's God's will for you to have divine health, and if you ever get sick, then you either don't have enough faith or there's sin or something like that. In fact, at the end of the sermon, I'll close it with four quick points on what I call the four spiritual flaws concerning healing. We always hear about the four spiritual laws and salvation, but this will deal with the four spiritual flaws, and those are things that aren't true things that are taken and preached as truth by a lot of preachers in our culture today, but they really don't hold biblical water. I'll put it that way. There's too many leaks in it. You just can't, you can't get that out of it. So let, let's look at our passage of Scripture today. There this little magic thing is. And uh, let's stand for the reading of the Word of God. I'll be going directly to James where he's talking about this very topic in the church in James chapter 5. And we'll look at verses 13 through 16 in this, in this passage. It says, Is anyone among you suffering... Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Some of y'all were actually singing praises. The rest of you were suffering. All right. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15 says, And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, 
If he has committed sins, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. May God bless the reading of that word today. You may be seated. There's a lot in here, and I've heard this presented in so many different ways, but I want us to kind of just uh, take this particular passage of Scripture apart today and look and see what the Lord is saying to the church. And I think the biggest emphasis of all this is the fact that the Lord is making a point that we need to be praying and we need to be seeking Him in prayer and we need to be turning everything over to Him, everything in our life. The Bible says that all your requests be made known to God. So if there's needs, we want to learn what it means. But we do live in a day where there's a lot of opposing views. And it seems to me, the more if I watch Christian TV channels, and there's never been so many Christian networks as there are today. I think there's like six or seven Christian networks out there on TV. The majority of the opinions kind of go in the direction of uh, what we call the prosperity preachers and the faith healers of the day. That would be those who fall in the line, like Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, Frederick Price, you know, Jesse Duplantis, they, that's that, that, that particular group. And you say, well, you shouldn't mention names. Well, how else are you going to know what I'm talking about? <laughs> All right. So that's for clarity's sake. They preach it. They shouldn't be ashamed of it to have their name called if they say it. All right. But there's a lot of that that comes out of that particular doctrinal camp that we'll address today and, and, and what are the answers. But I tell you, it's just as sad because on the other side of the camp, among some of my brothers and friends in Christ, Baptist and more along the conservative lines of evangelicals in that regard, uh, they, uh, they're just as, as bad off as the others. They, they'll come up with something like this, and I'll explain the rationale of it in a minute. They'll come up and say, well, what that means is that was back in those days they didn't have doctors in science and medicine that we do have today, so it's pretty much left to the pastor of the church to treat the sick. That doesn't hold biblical water at all either, all right? You can't find that in Scripture, although, you know, we, we know that, you know, that there, there, there were physicians and there were doctors and, and, and people who practiced the healing arts and medicines of those days. I don't think that you can say that, and this is what I've been told by friends that were close to me and pastors and, uh, and doctors of religion, theology, who said, well, what, what that really meant was in the church that they would come and the pastors would rub them down with oil for whatever their needs might be, you know, physically, and then pray, pray over them as, as they did that. So uh, we'll, we'll, we want to address that today. But it's pretty simple what, what, the, what, the, what James is telling us here. He says, first of all, let him call for the elders of the church, all right? And that's that word. It's talking about biblical elders within the body of Christ. And the second thing is they, those guys need to pray over him, whoever it might be, or her. And then as they're praying, they anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. It's pretty clear right there, amen? That's a simple request. And then it says, and it goes on to say, and that prayer, prayed in faith, you know, brings, brings results. So pretty simple. Let's call for the elders. Let them pray over him. Let's anoint that person with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, in the scripture, this word anoint is, is unique. It talks about anointing them with oil. There's two Greek words that are used in the New Testament, all right, for this particular word, anoint. The first word we look at is this word, kreon, and that particular word has to is used in a spiritual anoint it's, it comes from the word christos all right in the greek language which we get the word christ from jesus the christ jesus the anointed one all right so that that's one of the words that are used and it's used in a, what we say maybe a, a sacramental or, or spiritual sense often throughout the scriptures uh, it has to it's used five times in the, in the new testament that particular word creoin and it's used in the sense of when it refers to the the anointing of christ by god or or, or the uh, 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 with the holy spirit on christ's life to he sets him apart and anoints him as the messiah for salvation there's another word that's used in scripture for anoint that we translate from that greek language to the english language and that second word is the word that we have upon the screen the word alepho it's used a number of times in scriptures it's used in matthew 6 when he's saying but thou when, when you're fasting remember he's talking about how you fast you don't be pray to be seen of men and heard of men he says even when you're fasting he says you should anoint yourself with oil your head with oil and wash your face all right in other words you don't want to walk around trying to show everybody you're fasting, looking as poor and pitiful as you can. What do you, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fasting. <laughs> I'm, oh, who you, what are you fasting about? For you. Okay, oh, I need that. <laughs> so he said, that, that's a particular word. In fact, that is the word that James does use in this sense. And it's a word that's also used in Scripture in other places where, when he's talking about this, the idea of, of anointing someone in, in this regard. Now, oil was used for this anointing. The oil was used in scripture by to anoint priests and rulers 
pour, pouring oil over the head was a sign of consecration. Putting oil upon the head was another, another means of, of, of a consecration for a specific ministry and a, and a specific task. The Bible tells us, and this is, that's another whole sermon about anointing, that we are, as Christians, we now have the Holy Spirit. Oil symbolizes the Holy Spirit, by the way. We have the Holy Spirit, so we all, all of us that are Christians, we have all been anointed, all right? How are we anointed? By the Holy Spirit, this precious oil of God, all right? He, 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 he's the, the anointing one in, in our lives. You remember in the story of the, the parable of the Good Samaritan? You got this even in children's church, right? Where that the, there was the man who the, the religious people just walked by, they got to get to church, you know, they didn't time for him. And then there was the Good Samaritan who stopped and helped this man who'd been beaten up and robbed beside the highway. And it says that the Good Samaritan, he took this man, and when he saw him in the condition that he was in, it said he took oil and he took wine. And Luke 10 says that he rubbed it on him, all right, to minister to his physical needs and to the cuts, the bruises, and the wounds. So basically, he, as much as he had medicine on him, he applied it, all right? And then he took him to the inn and left him there and said, hey, if there's any other charges, you know, come back to me. I'll come back this way, and I'll take care of them. So there's kind of two, two uses we see. There's this first one, anointing with oil as a medicine kind of concept. And I said that I think that's where it comes from, that some preachers want to take this passage in James and just use it. Well, it was a medicinal thing, all right? But I think there's a whole lot more than James is saying here. The, the other way was the, the, the anointing with oil for symbolic purposes and, and sacramental purposes and, and uh, specific ministries being indicated for someone's life and, and calling. So how do, you, how do you relate this passage to what the need is? You know, in our church, we practice, you know, praying over people and anointing with oil. So, I mean, some people, maybe you're new around, you say, well, what's that all about? Well, hope this message will clarify that a little bit for you. You say, well, then... How do you, how do you di differentiate between that medicinal aspect and, and that spiritual aspect so that, you know, we, how, do we, how do we deal with this passage in the church, you know? Or is it sacramental purposes or is it medical purposes? What are we doing here? Well, first and foremost, I think that the big emphasis here, as much as anoint, is praying, all right? So I, I think with all my heart, I really believe this, that it's both. So that when someone comes to be prayed over, and they're sick, and they have an infirmity, when we pray over them, we are, in the simplest terms, turning that individual over completely to God that his will might be carried out and performed in their physical well-being or their mental, emotional well-being, whatever it might be. We're praying for God's healing hand to be applied to their life. And as much as we know how, we're praying believing, and we're, we're praying trusting now, whether God chooses to do it in that spiritual moment where there is an instantaneous healing or maybe a, 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 a speeding up the healing process or whether he uses science and medicine to minister to that in, in, in the overall need, the bottom line is for us, we're saying we're turning you over to the Lord and we're agreeing with you for God's will to be done in your life and we're, we're agreeing for God's healing mercies and his healing grace to be upon your life. Now, it would have helped if you're hearing this sermon today to have been here last week and heard the message on grace. Because you'll see in a moment, if you were here, how this ties into the grace of God. How that there's not a thing that you will go through in your life if you know Jesus personally, that the grace of God, if you're trusting the Lord, his grace is going to be available. His grace is going to be at hand. His grace is going to be ready. As Paul said, you know, he said, I'll, I'll begin to rejoice in my infirmities that, the, that God may be glorified in my life and that his grace can be manifest in my life. And we'll look a little bit closer at that passage in just a moment. But our, our understanding is that God is the source of our healing. God is the source of mercy. God is the place that we do find grace. So I personally contend for both of these, this, this mindset that, hey, here we're praying for mercy and grace. I, I've had Christian physicians and doctors that I've known or worked with over the years, and that's pretty much I've sat in rooms with them, and they said, well, we've done as much as we can do. We're turning it over to God now. That's the idea I think we all come to agree with. If God has blessed us with medicine and science, we ought to use that as much as he would allow us or give us a, you know, a, 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 a place to get to it and to experience it. But bottom line is we're not trusting that. We're trusting God. Bottom line is we believe God. Now, I believe God heals. I believe God supernaturally heals. I've experienced that in my own life. I've seen it in your lives, in many of your lives, that we prayed for and seen God do something. 
I've seen God, I've seen God heal somebody in, in our fellowship only for years later for them to have another issue, and God didn't heal that issue. And this is where our, our, our little human puny minds can't always get ourselves wrapped around what's going on. That's why I want to talk to you today also about the sovereignty of God versus the sovereignty of man. That God's ways are not our ways, and God's always up to something in our life, though. That whatever we're going through, whether he heals us or whether he doesn't heal, we can experience that journey in the grace of God. And out of it will come a testimony for the glory of God in our lives. I was praying for a woman just this morning who shared some real infirmities that she was dealing with. And, and, and as I closed the prayer, I, I simply said, and maybe you've heard me pray this over you before and didn't completely understand it. But I, would, I prayed to her and said, you know, Father, as I lift my sister up to you, I, I'm praying for her for, for healing. But Lord, and I'm not really even praying for her sake. I'm praying for Jesus' sake, that he might be glorified in touching her life. Obvious point in that is that we all we do all of our life is to be lived for the glory of God and if God heals me it's glorious if he doesn't heal me he's going to manifest his grace in my life and it's going to be healing somewhere to someone in the whole process of what's going on I don't understand it all but I know that God is faithful in it all I think I've shared this years ago with you guys how that back when I was in evangelism I was getting ready to go up to a revival in fact this revival was in my my Stepdad's my mother's church, you know. You all know Mom and L.R., we called him. And it was in their church in Albuquerque. And we were here in, in Houston, and my doctor was in the woodlands. Man, I was suffering terribly. There was something just killing me. I didn't know if I had appendicitis or what was going on. It was horrible. And so I went to my doctor on Friday because I, be I had to be in New Mexico in Albuquerque on Sunday morning. So I'm at the doctor and said, Go, doc, you got to give me something for this. I'd been praying all right already. You got to get me, I don't know what's going on. So he examined me with this. They said, so what you have? He says, you have a tear in, in the lining right here where your stomach and growing all this meat here. And he said, what's happening is, just put it in simple terms, you've got some of your inside parts pushing through that, that tear and it's pinching it off. And he said, you need surgery. We, we need to repair this. We need, we need to schedule a surgery, you know, for, for Monday at the latest, you know. I, I, I can't do that. I didn't tell him, I can't do it, one, because I don't have insurance. <laughs> Two, I'm poor as the church mouse, you know, is the guy that I'm living with. So not her, but the, the, the mouse. <laughs> I said, you know, I said, I, I, and plus that, I have this schedule. This is my livelihood. It's what I do. It's what God's called me. And God wants me in Albuquerque on Sunday, so I don't know how we're going to be back here on Monday for surgery. Because I'm supposed to be there all week long. And he kind of shook his head and said, yeah, whatever you say, you know, and let me go on my foolish way. So Kathy said, what are you going to say? We're well, just going to pray. God's going to give me grace. We'll get through this, I, you know. It, it only hurts when I stand up. <laughs> so I'll sit down as much as possible. So we get there, and I tell, tell my mom about it, and so we're praying. And so, but we do the revival, and you know, it goes Sunday, I think, through Thursday. And then Friday, my stepfather says, hey, you want to play golf? There's this beautiful golf course, you know, not too far from here. You know, he said, it's, 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 it's all up and down. He said, it's in the mountains, you know, up there. He said, so it's all up and down. He said, in fact, we, we, they don't have carts. You've got to have a pool car to carry your bag. I said, that sounds like fun. <laughs> and my mama sitting there says, are you crazy? What are you going to do about that tear? I hadn't thought about it since we prayed about it that, that Saturday night. I hadn't felt it. And it just came to me. Oh, I got healed. <laughs> What's going so I went and played golf. She was praying the whole time I wouldn't be stupid. And it, you know, I came back, no problem at all. Now, the golf game stunk, but, the, but the, the pain was gone, and it was, it was a healing. I wonder how many times we've asked the Lord about stuff like that in our life, and God did it. We didn't even come back like those foolish, you know, lepers who didn't come back and give thanks to the Lord. We just went on our way. I, I was in that category. I was so busy doing all these other things, I didn't even realize that God had done this, this supernatural thing in my life and, and brought this healing. You know, and praise God for that. But there's been other times he hadn't done it that way. There's been other times, and you maybe know some of these things in your own life where you've seen God do something one time and, and not do it the same way the next time. But the idea is this. Can we, can we trust the Lord that once we bring our burdens to him and once we pour our hearts out to him and once we give ourselves to him and we put all these things, as he says here, you pray in the name of the Lord, and that means I'm just coming in Jesus and, and for Jesus and in his sake, you know, that I can come. And one, I have to humble myself. I'm going to come for prayer, right? 
I have to be willing. Some folks, and you may be one of those people in this room, say, well, I just don't think anybody needs to know what's going on in my life. Just poor me. Listen, you're in a family now when you're a believer's fellowship. You're, you're part of a larger group of family. We, we want to know. I want you to know when I need prayer. You need to know, you know, you need to tell me when you need prayer. That's why I thank God for our prayer line and the ministry that goes on there. And it seems like such a little simple thing, but man, what a powerful instrument that's in our hands that we can instantaneously know through, through, through the internet what each other's needs are this way. And it goes out and praise God for Melissa who's always so, I mean, sometimes if she gets them late night, she's putting them out late at night when she gets an alert on her phone. And I told her yesterday, you know, I didn't like something she did. I told her going to have to kill her. She all pray for me. <laughs> I said, but I was just kidding. All right, no. I know. That's another joke we'll get back to later. But anyway, what an opportunity for us to share need. If you're not getting prayer requests, you get signed up. There's a form on the table back there somewhere. You get signed up to, to get the, those prayer requests. If you're not giving prayer requests, shame on you. Don't be arrogant, you know. Don't be proud. We all need the grace of God. So I want people to know my business. They know it anyway, so get over it. All right. <laughs> we'll pray. We we'll know it with awe. Now, this is not magic. This is not some exorcism, you know, or some magical rite that we're doing. This is, this is simply an opening up ourselves to God and the power of God to intervene, you know. In any case, maybe a demon is involved. God's going to intervene. Maybe it's just physical. God can intervene. But it's giving ourselves over and over. James deals with this pretty much over and over. We give ourselves over and over to God. He tells us in verse 13, if you're suffering, and the word there is kind of like if you're in distress, if there's a problem, if there's trouble, he says, what did you do? He said, you pray. In, in verse 14, he says, if you're sick, you pray. And you ask the elders to pray for you. He goes on to say, in verse 16, pray for one another. In, the, in, in verses 17 and 18 down, he refers and makes reference to Elijah, who was a man of like faith, and he prayed. So what's he saying? Hey, well, no matter what you're going through, you pray, because the prayer of a righteous person avails, avails much. It's effective. It makes a difference. And that's where you've got to come to the place of, of, of believing prayer. I'm praying. I believe God's hearing me. I believe God's committed to me. This may surprise you. I believe God really does love me. And maybe you need to say that to yourself. I believe God really does love me. All right? Why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, God really does love you. Go ahead. Go, just take, take, tell them they need to hear it again. All right? God really does love you. That might surprise you. You've heard it over and over again. And, you're, and I knew you were thinking, oh, I don't know how you can love me. I don't either. <laughs> but he does. All right? In the midst of our mess, he still loves us. So what do we We run to him. And how clearly this teaching corresponds, if you look at the book of James to, to chapter 4, all right, of just, he said, you're not receiving because you're not asking, Amen. you know? You're too busy just being selfish. And there's a difference between being selfish and then really praying and trusting the Lord. Say, not being selfish, say, God, I have this issue I need help with. I need your mercy. I need your healing. I need your deliverance, whatever it might be. And the promise gets clear as you follow the story. He says, he says if we ask anything, John, John put it this way, 1 John 5, if we ask anything according to his will, we know God hears us. Amen. So I'm praying. I'm asking that God's will be done. I'm, if I know God's will, I'm praying the will of God. Verse 15, this verse, and the prayer of faith saves the sick and the Lord will raise him up. What is the prayer of faith? It's prayer that is prayed according to God's will. Now we know it's God's will for us to pray. We don't always know what to pray. But I think that we can go to the Lord with what we do know, all right? Well, I don't know if the Lord wants me to heal me here or not, but I do know I need to turn it over to him. And I do know I need grace, and I do know I need wisdom. And if I don't know, I do ask for healing, <laughs> all right? When people come to the altar, I pray for healing, you know? But I also pray that if, God, if you do not do it instantaneously and supernaturally and miraculously, however means, whatever means, you're going to give grace and mercy, and eventually we're all going to be healed, called there's a doorway you have to go through called death but you don't have to worry as a christian because it holds no sting and it's nothing to be feared we walk through it right into the presence of jesus christ and the glory of god we call that the ultimate healing amen but when we pray at the altar in this situation we're basically leaving the results with god he's to be trusted with my heart with my body with my life all that i have is his all that we are is his we we trust him he is our father he is our lord he is our king and he is committed to us 
And there's one more thing about this text I, I just want to expose to you real quick about verse 15. It almost gets o overlooked at points. Is, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. All right? Now, the idea is that there are, we'll see in a moment, there are some things that can open the door to sickness in our life. There are some things that might open the door. Not always, but sometimes it could be because we have sinned. So when I get sick, one of the first things I do is ask, Lord, have I blown it somewhere? Am I messing up? I don't have to wait long for that answer because usually I already know what that answer is. You say, why do you know? Because the Holy Spirit lives in me. And if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives in you. And the Holy Spirit has a way of pointing the things that need to be known to make them clear to you. Especially if Jesus says, when I come, I'm going, another's coming, and he will reprove you. And that word means he'll instruct you of sin and righteousness and judgment. All right? In fact, he says he'll do that for the whole world. He's going to show the whole world if they're in sin. That's part of the Holy Spirit's ministry. And he's going to reprove us. He's going to give us instruction. If we don't respond to that, then judgment. All right? So there's this element of the Holy Spirit has this ministry in my life, and that's another series we'll get into later in the year on the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. But part of that is not just to convince me and convict me when I'm wrong, but to show me specifically what it is and to turn that over specifically back to God. So if there is something that's associated with it, we become very well aware of it because the Holy Spirit's ministry is to help me to become aware of it. Now, some people say, well, that verse proves that all sickness in your life is caused by sin. That's not what James wrote. No matter what language it, 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 you translate it to, that sentence says, and if he has committed sin, if this sickness is because of sin and he's getting his heart right with God, all right, if he has, that, that sin's going to be taken care of. It's going to be forgiven. All right? So this is this, 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 my mom used to call that long-tailed letter, that IF, you know, that, that, that is in there. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. It kind of corresponds to the story where Jesus is healing the man who's been born blind, and the disciples are asking him, y'all remember that? Whose fault is this, that he's born this way? Is it his fault, or is his mom or dad's sin? You know, what, what's going on here? Uh, you know, Jesus responded to them very clearly. He said, neither this man nor his parents have sinned, but this blindness, this, this is here, the, that the works of God could be clearly revealed in him. In other words, this happened just so God could be glorified, so that God could do something very clearly and make a difference in people's lives. I think the conclusion of James is pretty clear when you read the passage. If a person has sinned and prays a prayer of repentance and faith, which is necessary for his healing, then the sins will be forgiven of him. I think it's kind of foolish of me to ask God to bring healing if I'm rebelling against him in areas of my heart and life. I mean, that's almost kind of being what you call pushy. <laughs> that kind of goes with this, this world's mindset of entitlement. We think God just owes us all something. You know, we have this merit-based system. Well, I came to church. I ought to get healed. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It's a God of mercy and grace, but we have this responsibility. But what's come out of that verse is, again, what we call those flaws, you know, the, the people have adopted, and we call them, uh, the, as I said, well, I'll, I'll just give you the title for the, what we call them here. You've heard of the four spiritual laws. This is the four spiritual flaws of faith healers, of the people who tell you that it's always God's will to heal you no matter what, and you should be completely, instantaneously, supernaturally delivered. All right, well, let me give you the four flaws. Flaw number one is this. Symptoms are merely a trick of the devil to steal the guarantee of your divine health, that God has guaranteed you divine health that you should never be sick, all right? And because you should never be sick, if you're suffering symptoms, they're just symptoms, you're not really sick. And what you have to do to realize is those symptoms are merely a trick of Satan to convince you that you are sick. And so what you need to do is you've got to outwit the devil and stand upon the promises for your divine health and your divine healing and be, be healed. But you know, there's, there's, not, there's not a lot of biblical ground to stand on there. It's one thing to get up and preach something. People preach all kinds of stuff every day from pulpits all across America. If, if it doesn't hold, as I said, biblical water, if it, doesn't, you know, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't set with Scripture, then don't believe it. And this is something that absolutely doesn't set with Scripture. You can't find anywhere in the Bible that God guarantees that every Christian is never going to get sick and he's, on, he's always going to be healed. 
But that's what, that's, that's what these guys present and what they teach. And, and they, then they go through the second flaw of, of divine healing is this one. It's that the, that the source of, uh, that Satan is ultimately the source of all your sickness. And that's why you see these guys raging against demons and ca casting out the demon of this and the demon of that and the, the demon of pneumonia and the demon of, you know, cancer and the demon of this. And, you know, the guy told me one time I had one of those demons. I told him, you got a demon of stupid. And I had to repent from attitude. <laughs> there, are pro there are times, obviously, we've seen in Scripture when somebody was sick and it was related to demons. But that's not every situation. And nor does, that all of the times that Jesus healed, does it say that demons were related to every sickness? It never says that. There were different situations and different people experiencing different things. Now, one of the, one of the things that these faith healers have to do is they, they have to take, if there's something in the Bible that's contrary to what they're teaching, then they have to tell you that that's not what it really means. Job is one who stands in that, 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 that place. Most faith healers will tell you that Job is just a mess. He's a tragedy, you know, uh, that, you know, that God, God doesn't, you know, uh, allow the devil to do something in the life of the believer or bring a problem in the life of the believer, you know, and they don't believe that God would ever allow sickness on any level. So they have to go after Job because you remember the story of Job. The Bible said Job was, the, was a righteous man, in fact, about the most righteous man who lived on the earth at that particular time. It all starts off with a little meeting between the, the devil and, and God. And the devil says, you know, hey, God, man will not serve you without getting something out of it. Context of it, I think King James says, will a man serve God for nothing? Or does he have to get something to serve God? God says, yeah, a man will serve me for nothing just because he loves me. Oh, is that so? Yeah, well, look at Job. Well, you've blessed the socks off of Job. <laughs> That's the Joe Arms translation, okay? <laughs> Look at him. He's just blessed and he's bountiful and he's prospering. Take all that away, I bet he won't. And so God gives the enemy permission at this moment. He only goes as far as God lets him go. He can't take his life. And out of that comes the story of a man who stands by God through all the hell that he goes through. But when you listen to faith preachers, and I've heard these guys, and I've heard Benny Hinn say these specific words, you know, he said, you know, that really, you know, Job shouldn't be in the hall of fame in chapter 11 of Hebrews. He really ought to be in the hall of shame because he didn't know how to trust God. And he didn't know how to believe God. And he had all those diseases and all those boils and all those problems that kept coming over on him because, you know, he was carnal. I mean, that's what they use those term, that term. Job was carnal. But that's not what the Bible says. God does have him in the hall of faith in chapter 11. In fact, God calls Job, not carnal, God calls Job upright. All right? Now, he's obviously through the whole thing, when you watch the process, God's dealing with Job. God says, Job is good. Those guys say Job is bad. God says, Job has spoken rightly. Those guys say, Job, had, Job didn't speak rightly. He's making negative confessions. So that's sin. And so it must be sin. So if you take a guy like Job, and we'll see there's some other New Testament examples as well, of a believer firmly committed to God, suffering, then you've got to do something about that if you believe this other story, if you're one of these, 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 these false teachers. You've got to destroy that and say, that's not what that really means, and here's what it really does mean. He really wasn't a man of faith. He really didn't believe God. Because that story, the book of Job, is in total opposition to these faith healers. Here was a guy who suffered tremendously, who lost tremendously. How do you explain that? Well, he just didn't believe God. No. I think here's the problem. Well, there's two things. Let me give you this, 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 this third one first. I'll tell you, healing won't come because of sin, which Job relates to that in their mindset. But what this does, it just fails to recognize that some of God's choicest people, some of his choice saints have suffered lifetimes. And many of God's great saints of God, many of great God's, God's great prophets and preachers have died young. I mean, there's some great preachers from the past that were great men of God whose books are still out there to this day who are part of great revivals. I mean, who died at the age of 28 and 29 and 30 and 31. Is that because they couldn't believe God? Because they didn't have enough faith? Because they didn't make a positive confession? 
I'll take the message of those men above many times, any time over the message of these guys who say a Christian should never deal with suffering. We talked about grace last week. Remember, we talked about the, the apostle Paul. The problem is, you know, these people, you know, do a lot of damage. When someone comes into their meetings and they tell the, the blind or the deaf or the quadriplegic or those that are sick, hey, you're that way because you've got sin in your life or you don't have enough faith. And if you had enough faith, you'd get up out of that chair and you'd walk today. That is a lie. And I don't want to have to be the guy that says those kind of things and faces God in the end on those things. Some of God's greatest people have suffered some of the greatest, tremendous, most difficult times of life. But out of their life and out of the message of their life has poured some of the greatest testimonies of God's grace. And the message of their life has transformed thousands of other people in the process. But on the other hand, you look at how many profane, wicked, ungodly people have had wholesome bodies and wholesome lives. But eternity is another story, is it not? The fourth spiritual law ties right into this as we're talking about those reasons where God does or does not heal these situations. This is the issue of really a need for correct doctrine. They say that sovereignty is not really the issue here. Sickness is the issue. And what they do, they basically, they elevate their, the sovereignty of man and their positive confession or their own faith above, against and over the sovereignty of God. They forget that clause that Jesus preaches on the Mount of Olives about praying to your Father's will and ends in the Garden of Gethsemane at the end of his earthly ministry. He said, nevertheless, not my will be done. They forget 1 John 5, 14, if we ask anything according to God's will. All too often with these kind of teachers, it's not about God's will. It's about what you want and what your will is. And if you're not getting your way, then certainly there must be something wrong in your life. When what really is not the issue is your way. The real issue is the will of God. And what does God want? And what does God desire? Is God going to heal me? Is God not going to heal me? That's in God's hands ultimately. But you can't put your will and say everybody's supposed to be healed. That's taking the sovereignty of the teacher and putting it over the sovereignty of God. Because God may be saying, like he said to Paul, I'm going to allow this infirmity. In fact, what did Paul say? It's the same as Job's situation. They were messengers of Satan. They were dealing with Job and his problem. And Paul said, Lord, take this from me. How many times did he pray that? Three. And then he heard God speak, and God says, you're experiencing this because I want you to experience my grace. This is the thing. Ultimately, this again, kind of my bottom line of that incident was, this is the way I'm going to keep you trusting me, holding on to me. This is the way I'm going to keep you needing me. That every day, you're going to have to bring this to me. And every day, you're going to have to walk in fellowship with me. And every day, you're going to experience me or you're going to give way to this infirmity of your flesh, whatever it is. And you're going to live in defeat and despair and despondency. Which path will you choose, Paul? But in choosing, I want you to understand, my grace is sufficient. Amen. It's ample. Yes. It's what you need. Yes. It'll carry you through. The message was the same to, the, to Job. It's, it's the same to others throughout Scripture who walked in, in, in these situations. Jesus taught us on the, pray, uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. He taught us to pray, you know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth in my life as it is in heaven. Again, at Gethsemane, Jesus saying, not as I will, but as you will. James warns people in Scripture that are prone to brag. If you go back and read the book of James, he says, listen, you better pray, if it be thy will, O Lord, I'll see you today, I'll see you tomorrow. Yes. It's God's will that's, that's involved here. And again, John writes it this way. This is what we know. If we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. This whole, this whole scenario of these four spiritual laws, it just doesn't fit the, the Bible. There's so many like Job and, and, and Paul. There, there's other, we know with Paul's problem, it was that thorn in the flesh. But again, th there's others in this situation. He, told, he tells Timothy in Scripture, Timothy obviously had an intestinal issue going on. He says, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Now, I know a lot of social drinkers who like to quote this verse to me. You are not standing on biblical ground here. This is not about social drinking. This is about medicinal need. And alcohol was used medicinally even today in the right 
place in the right amount in the right form. Because he didn't say drink a half a bottle of wine every night. That guy told me the other day, he said, I'm going to come to your church, but you need to know I drink a little wine. I said, well, how much wine do you drink? This is just two day, about two weeks ago. Well, I drink about two 10-ounce glasses a night. I said, that's half a bottle. Well, it helps me sleep better. <laughs> you just knock yourself out. <laughs> a lot cheaper, you let me come over with a hammer every evening. <laughs> how much wine is, is Timothy supposed to drink? A lot. <laughs> no, a little. A little. Well, why didn't, I mean, who is closer to Paul's heart than this guy? Obviously, he's Paul's son in the faith, is he not? Amen. Well, Paul, I'm reading in Scripture, when you just walk by people and the shadow fell on some folks, they got healed. Amen. And Paul, obviously, you have a gift of healing because it talks about how in the book of Acts and other places, people were healed. Paul, listen, you got bit by the most poisonous viper in the Mediterranean. You just shook it off. God healed you. Can't you do a little something for Timothy and tell him to drink a little wine? <laughs> Apparently, it wasn't God's will, was it? Paul had his own infirmity he had to deal with. Drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. For your, in fact, he didn't say, this is just a passing deal. He said, there are, you're having continual problems, physical problems. There are often infirmities. But that's not the only guy. What about Paul himself, as we said? You know, what's he, how's he do it? How's Paul going to do it? With his, I'm going to take pleasure in the fact that I've got this thing that's staring me in the face every day because I experienced Jesus. It's the one thing that runs me to the cross. It's the one thing that keeps me in fellowship. It's the one thing that I, I, I'm, I'm trusting God with in my life. I can't, I can't do this without God. Now, we all are in the same place. We can't do what we need to do without God. Some of us need some reminders more than others sometimes. How about Trophimus? This is another guy who traveled with the Apostle Paul wherever he went. And Paul telling the church of Corinth, all right, I I know you want to see Trophimus, but I'm sorry. I had to leave him sick back at Miletum. You did what? Why didn't you just heal him? You have that capacity. Well, James is saying we all have that capacity. As Christians, may not have a gift of healing, but hey, we can all pray for one another. Because ultimately, who is the healer? You're not the healer. Paul's not the healer. James is not the healer. Benny Hinn's not the healer. Kenneth Copeland's not the healer. Jesus is the healer. Amen. Jesus is the healer. Amen? <laughs> now, I think if you boil it down, Peter writes it most clearly when he wrote in 1 Peter 4, 9. He says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Did you catch that? Let me say it again. He says, wherefore, if you're suffering according to the will of God, in other words, your suffering is not from your sin or being disobedient to God, the suffering that you hadn't invited in, all right? If there's suffering that's going on in your life that's according to the will of God, you need to commit to keeping of your souls to your heavenly Father just in well-doing. In other words, you're living for Jesus in spite of these things. You're going to commit to Christ because he is a faithful creator. Amen. What a great verse. Let me close with just... Simple, wrap this up in what I would call just three types of sickness. I don't remember where I, where I got this, but I, it made a profound impact upon my life many years ago. That there are in Scripture and in our lives, really, there's what we call a sickness unto death. Do you believe in divine healing? Or are you just going to walk right into heaven one day? No, you're going to die <laughs> unless Jesus comes first. I'm going to die, you know. <laughs> Not real positive, is it? <laughs> But you're going to die. And God may choose to take you out of this world to an infirmity. Heart issues. Multiple issues could go on in your life. And you have to understand that when Adam and Eve sinned and they sinned against God, this planet fell into absolute chaos, pain, sickness, misery, and suffering. I don't think we'll see the wages of sin, what it really, what it really brought onto, onto the, to the planet and upon to us as individuals and the human race until we stand one day in glorified bodies before the King of Kings in spotless array. And then we'll look back over our shoulders and say, man, we fell much further than I ever thought. We've fallen a long way. But so this is in this world. We're living in the midst of it. In this world, you'll have tribulation, the Bible says. It's, it's, it's the habitation. Hey, but we've talked about Jesus coming. It'll be a new heaven, a new earth. It's going to be a different day. There'll be no more sickness, no more sorrow, 
No more saying goodbyes, all right? And eternal hellos and eternal God bless you is where it's going to be. But it could be that the Lord uses this means take you out. You need to go out in the grace of God. You need to go out plotting Jesus and pointing everybody around you. Hey, there's a way to die. Not in fear, not in sorrow, but I just can't wait to hold Jesus' hands. I've sat by the side of beds of people who didn't know Jesus and died. And I've been by the bed of many more Christians who love Jesus and died. And it's as different as day and night. There's such blackness and hopelessness in the presence of that kind of death when people don't have God in their life versus that person who's just reaching out, smiling. I've seen them get out of their bed, get on their knees. When the doctors leave the room, this one particular woman, her husband was on the board of my evangelism ministry. She passed as a result of cancer in her life. She had all these faith people come in and tell her how she wasn't believing God, and she's making this. She said, I got a word from God. God told me it's homecoming for me, and this is how I'm going, and I've accepted it. But when the doctors left her room, and everybody just stepped out for a while, they came back in the room, and she was out of her bed. She could barely move. On her knees with her hands in front of her in the presence of Jesus. She's gone. I mean, it was just her shell. Others, like my mom reaching up, my granddad, I can hear him, can't y'all? Singing. Y'all don't, y'all don't hear the singing. There comes a time when you're going to depart this world. If you're not ready for it, my heart breaks for you. There's another sickness under chastening. Paul talked about to the Corinthian church. Remember, he said, you're coming, and you're, you're coming to the Lord's table about communion. Remember, communion represents the blood sacrifice for our sin. And he said, you guys are living in sin and come and take in the Lord's Supper, which represents taking away your sin and shows clearly the price for your sin, and you're walking in your sin. How can you do that? The Apostle John said he, he died to take away our sins. Why would you come? To, he said, what you need to do, before you come take the Lord's Supper, you get your hearts right, examine yourself, see if you're in the faith. You know, get your life right. That doesn't mean get right for the Lord's Supper, take the Lord's Supper, and then go back into your sin. <laughs> All right, it has to do with repentance. He said, so you're being chastened. Hebrews says, every son of, every one of God's children will experience chastening of times in their life. Well, why? Because none of God's children are perfect. And so God chastens us, and he deals with us. And we know when he's dealing with us, by the way, right? You know when God's speaking to you. The third element of sickness is, is unto the glory of God. Why is this person sick? They asked Jesus. This happened for the glory of God. Whether he heals them or gives them grace, the glory of God can still be seen in our lives. And that ought to be our heart's cry, and that ought to be our prayer. The Lord, if I have to undergo this sickness, if you don't deliver me out of this, then you're going to deliver me in this. It's like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember? They had to go into the fire to find the deliverance. And they had to endure that. Healing. Boy, it's, it's hard to wrap your heart and mind and head around it especially when God heals somebody and doesn't heal you. <laughs> but you can't say that person's the pattern for how God works in everybody's life. God's going to work in my life the way God needs to work in my life. And God's going to work in your life the way you need him to work in your life. And I think what James is wrapping and saying, and he says, it, so you pray for one another, you encourage one another, you lift each other up. But if you, if you do face an infirmity, What's your first step? Pray. And then if nothing's going, they said, then call for the elders. And have, have the church elders pray for you. But what are we doing in all this? We're committing all of this to God. We have these bottles of oil up here. There, there's nothing miraculous in, you know, in these bottles. All right? If there was, I'd be bathing in it <laughs> daily. All right? It's oil. Now, you know, praise the Lord for our sisters who put this oil up here and prepare it. And it's pretty much similar to as much as we can understand of the Old Testament anointing oils, all right, that are in Scripture. They have a nice, sweet, fragrant smell to them. But there's nothing magical about it. It's like a picture of the Holy Spirit and us saying, Lord, apply your grace and your spirit to my situation. And so we pray together for you and we lift you up. We pray for healing. 
when I pray for him, you say, well, Joe, when you pray for him, how do you pray? Maybe you're new around the church, and you've seen us do this, and you're questioning it. You say, I thought that said a Baptist out there on that sign. Is this Assembly Church? <laughs> We're Christian first, all right? <laughs> We're believers in the Bible. When we pray for people to be anointed with oil, we all pray a little differently, but we simply put the oil on people's forehead as our symbol of saying we are trusting God with you, and we're praying with you that God will touch your life today. And because I don't always know God's will in these situations, and most of the time don't, sometimes the Lord has led me to pray a certain specific way, and I prayed that way and believed I was praying according to his will of God. At that point, I just simply say, Lord, I'm praying for healing. I ask you to do something supernatural. We're asking you in Jesus' name for your glory to do something natural, supernatural. And when we're praying for people like that, I, I know I've prayed for some of you. You might not have quite understood it when I've said something like, well, Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm praying for this person, but I'm not really, I'm not praying for their sake. I'm praying for Jesus' sake. That Jesus, you might be glorified in their life. Because that's what it really comes back to. Will you be glorified in my life today? And whether you're glorified by healing me in the instant or healing me a month from now, six months from now, or healing me, or taking me home through this infirmity, however you choose to do it. Lord, I'm committed to that. But we as a church pray together, and we believe God, and we take this passage of Scripture very seriously. We don't try to, as I said, I've had other pastors, it just means to rub somebody down. If we have medicine today, we, don't, we just ignore that passage. I don't think that's applicable. But I think we have an opportunity from God to pray and to trust, commit our ways to the Lord, and he establishes everything else. I do know that there are times when people begin to pray in these processes that God gives them more clarity on what the will of God is as we begin to seek his face. And that's when we begin to confess God's will and purposes and whatever it might be. It might be that God does want to heal me, and he'll make it clear to me, I believe, and he'll show me, and I can begin to pray in that regard. It may be God saying, I want to show you my strength. I want you to have a supernatural strength. I want you to experience a new walk on a new level that you would never experience if you didn't have to go through this. And let me tell you, as much as I hate to see people I love suffer and the people I care about and my church family suffer, the period of our suffering compared with eternity, you can't even measure how small it is. It's microscopic. What's your team? It doesn't seem like that. That's going on, don't it? In the big picture, it is. Be faithful. Be humble. Stay true to Jesus Christ. You'll see his healing hand, either in grace or deliverance. Amen. But the most important thing is you experience him in your life. Let's stand with our heads bowed today. Our Heavenly Father is so gracious. He sent Jesus to die for us when we certainly didn't deserve his death or the price that he would pay. The Apostle Paul writes, if Christ Jesus died for you and God sent him to provide for your salvation, don't you think he will also commit to meeting every need in your life? That's his mercy and that's his grace and that's his blessing. We give an invitation, one, because people could come at these times and be prayed for. But it's not only for that. If you want to come today, if you're facing infirmity, we can pray and lift you up to the Lord. We'd be glad to do that. Anoint you with oil if you'd like that. But make it be that you just need to come to the altar because you know that there's something in your heart that's not been right with God. And that's the very thing that's keeping you away from enjoying the grace. Paul wasn't saying, I'm exercising this rebellion in my life. That's my thorn. It might have been a temptation to something like that. It might have been a physical infirmity. I probably had to do something physically with him. There was something going on. But whatever it was, grace is sufficient. So you have to trust the Lord by obedience. Put your faith in him, and you experience God. I encourage you, if there's, not, if there's something between you and the Lord today, as a Christian, you come find a place in the altar and turn it over to him. He's your high priest. You need to come to him. The Bible says we come to the throne of grace to find help in time of need. God's grace is available. Come to the altar. If you don't know Christ today, won't you come? Let any one of us share with you how you can know Jesus personally as your Lord and Savior. We'd enjoy, we'd love 
to introduce you to the one who can change your life. Maybe you're looking for a church home. You live for the Lord's leading you. Step out today. Come let one of these gentlemen know. I want to be a part of Believer's Fellowship. Let us rejoice with you and pray with you. But whatever it is, we sing this song of invitation. You come. Let's be a part of what God's doing today.
we can feel your mercy falling you are turning our hearts back again here our praises rise to heaven draw us near Lord and meet us here cause it's your Jesus' sake and for Jesus' glory, your will be done here in these hearts and these lives. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Amen, amen. Well, God is certainly good. Can I get a witness to that? Amen and hallelujah. A couple things, let me just say real quickly. Uh, give everybody a moment to focus here. If you haven't signed up, I don't know what you're waiting for. <laughs> I don't want you to miss this. We've got Michael Smalley coming. Maybe you've heard Michael. He's been on lots of interviews on KSBJ and things like that at different times. They've, they've had him on there a few times on Christian radio. He's out of the woodlands. Uh, some people may be more familiar with his dad. He wrote lots of books on marriages and home and family, Gary Smalley. This is his son. He has a practice in the woodlands. And uh, we're just real blessed and privileged to be able to have him for our conference this year. I figured you were tired of hearing me, Brother Tim. <laughs> Don't you dare say amen. <laughs> so we got Michael coming. You're, you're going to be blessed. Listen, there's no way to make this any cheaper than what we've done it. It's hotels and all the expenses that are involved in putting this together and having speakers in. So uh, we're always very conscious about what the price is. That's probably why, you know, uh, uh, we'll probably, as we started a year or so ago, having one at much less cost here at church campus just over a weekend sometimes. But felt like it was really a good time for us to get away. Some of y'all spend more than that on a smart TV which hasn't done a thing for your marriage. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Man, I've gone back to preaching, hadn't he? Some of y'all spend more than that on your hobby. Spend more than that on gun. I have. Uh-oh, it's also my elbows firing off right there. <laughs> but the most important thing in your life is not bagging that next deer. Most important thing in your life, if you're married, other than Jesus, is sitting beside you, hopefully, this morning in church. 
Nurture that. Cherish that. Care for that. Take care of that. You've never too, been married too long to not go to a marriage conference. All right? This is, this is not like you might have seen on one of the TV shows or movies about marriage retreats. Nothing like that at all. It's a great time of fellowship and friendship and relationship. It's also a great time of study and getting into the Word of God together and encouraging each other. So come be a part of this. I just can't put enough emphasis upon that so that, that you know, that we're only like, I don't know how many spots are left, but I know it, you know, it, it comes like real fast. So get on board and come along with us. Again, also I'll remind you that there are brochures out in the lobby. Pick yours up. You can go online, make your deposit there. Also about the Israel trip, I remind you about that. Take care of that business as well. Your staff is going off to a staff retreat. Maybe Gary will say something about a minute. So be praying for our staff this week. Also, a really important event happens uh, it, it tomorrow, my wife's birthday. So don't be sure and tell Miss Kathy. She's at the back back there making faces at me. Like, don't you dare announce my birthday. So, <laughs> so happy birthday to Miss, Miss Kathy. Amen. So be sure and tell her before we leave today. So, Brother Gary, a few just closing announcements, and we'll be done, and we'll praise the Lord. Amen. Last, uh, Crystal, to give a report of the youth camp she we, they went on this previous week, last week. Yes, we had a great time at youth this uh, at camp this last week. Um, I felt a little outnumbered. This is the first time that we had um, a group of so many newcomers, lots of twelve year olds. I was a little nervous, but um, it was really great. You know, we have a really I don't know if you guys realize this, but we've got a great group of kids. They're so well behaved. They're so respectful. So kudos, parents. You've done a great job raising your kids. Um, but yeah, we had a really good time. Um, we, you know, a time of worship, learning the, from the word. Um, we had beach time and game time and quality time. Miss Marina fed us really well. Um, it was just, it was great. We saw, yeah, she did a great job. Um, we saw kids get right with the Lord. Um, and this was a dual purpose trip. We had our time as a group, and then we had our time of outreach. Um, because it's about discipleship, we're discipling um, your teens, and you're never too young to share the love of God, share the love of Jesus. You're never too old either. Um, but we had a time of, um, we were planning a time of prayer on Wednesday night. So we set out on the seawall in the strand Tuesday and Wednesday morning, and we just went and talked to people. And we, um, you know, walked up to him. We introduced ourselves. We let them know that we were going to be getting together as a group on Wednesday and praying and that we'd love to pray for any need that they might have. And let me tell you, God opened so many doors. You know, our kids were timid at first. They were scared. You know, what about, you know, what if they reject us? But we saw such a great response. You know, God sent so many divine appointments. People cried and they opened up and they shared their hearts with us and we prayed for people. We loved on people. We took down request after request. After those two days, we had over 15 pages filled with prayer requests. And those are needs that, you know, were taken to the Lord in prayer that might not have even been addressed had we not stepped out in obedience. So the next time that you might get that little nudge from God to, hey, you know, go pray for this person, even if you don't know them and you're scared of rejection, just remember all of our 12-year-olds and our older ones too, we had some 17-year-olds, but all those kids who got out there and shared the love of Jesus without fear and God just worked so mightily. Um, so thank you for those who prayed for us, who gave scholarships. It really was a great trip. Amen. Amen. If you were not here yesterday, uh, Crystal just talked about having an opportunity to pray for people. If you were not here, here yesterday at the clothing distribution day, you missed an opportunity. We were able to bless 99 families. That equaled 251 kids receiving clothes for the school year. We prayed for people who are hurting, whose families are separated, we prayed for foster parents. We prayed for just people that are hurting financially, emotionally, spiritually. There were eight people, dedicated people yesterday. And with that, they were able to pray and to bless through God, of course, through the uh, clothing pantry, 99 families. So thank you all for those that did. With that, we raised a little over $1,600. 
But it was such a blessing. Uh, and, and on that, and just to make the service a little bit longer, um, I've asked Jordan today, or Thursday was Jordan's last day as his summer intern, and I've asked him to come up and speak. Um, first, I want to thank Pastor Joe for the opportunity. Uh, he called me back in March right after spring break. Of course, Mom, I was studying, as you do at college. That's all I did. <laughs> uh, but uh, he called me to see if I was interested. And, um, you know, I prayed about it. And, uh, and, of course, I ended up doing it. And another thank you to the whole staff. Uh, man, I didn't realize how much went into just putting on this service right here. I didn't realize that before. So thank you to the, all of the staff for what you guys do. Um, I learned a lot um, how to change a spotlight. Uh, <laughs> um, I learned uh, getting down in the sewers. Uh, I, um, uh, just a lot of, you know, everyday things uh, like, like changing spotlights. But um, I got to minister to a lot of people inside and outside of church. Um, I got to know a lot of you guys more than I, and than I did before. I got the uh, very first day I had the internship uh, was the Monday after the Santa Fe shooting. And um, uh, I, I was able to drive down there and, and pray with, with hurting people of that. And uh, just, just from day one, I was able, you know, my biggest prayer was just use me where you need to. And I, and I feel like I was. Um, I feel like I did a good job. But uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and last, thank you to my dad, who uh, just really showed, showed me uh, how, how to be a man. And it, it keeps showing me and, and has shown me. Uh, the, one of the first weeks I was offered a desk in the front, and I didn't want to sit there because I wanted to sit in his office. And I got a little toddler table, a little toddler <laughs> chair, but I'm not bigger, much bigger than a toddler anyway, so I made it work. Um, but I enjoyed spending time in your office, just listening, just talking, uh, moving furniture, setting up Wednesday nights. By the way, all those little uh, pies with the pastor, that was me. Uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, just uh, thank you to everyone who uh, supported me. Thank you to my parents, my dad especially. And um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> We're not criers or anything. Um, Eric, you remember this. Awanas, Awana graduation. Jordan had to give a speech, and he stood right here, and I was down there. This is probably the most proudest I've been since that day of him spiritually, just being able to give that, that scripture and now seeing him every day live that scripture out. So, figured you'd remember that. All right. All right. Awanas. Registration starts uh, August 26th. You can always go by the lobby today and pick up the pre-registration form or go to bfchurch.com. No Wednesday night service this Wednesday, of course, will be at the staff retreat. Please be praying for us. We are coming back strong on the 22nd. And thank you to the Castleberries. We are having a nacho bar on the 22nd. If you have not come to Wednesday night, I tell you what, we feed you well and we feed you both with food and with spiritual food. So you're gonna get, you're gonna get fed spiritually and, and literally fed. So come on on Wednesday nights. Great time, great hour. Uh, food pantry, we have lots of bread, lots of desserts, lots of cupcakes, lots of cookies, lots of just carbs. So come on out and get some. Don't forget your tithes and offerings. Uh, it's important uh, as we honor the Lord to also in that uh, area of opportunity to worship him in that. Uh, final slide, leadership meetings, Friday, September 7th at the New Magnolia campus. We should be open, ready for business. So turn to the person next to you, tell them you're glad you came to church and y'all have a good, good night. And don't forget services tonight.